I was only 21 when I found myself in some serious debt. A bit of fun here and there at the casinos, and suddenly, I owe at least 30k to some dangerous men. I settled on a minimum wage gig at Jollibee's to pay it off. Where on the very first day, they shoved a mascot costume onto me. They told me to go outside, attract customers, whatever that meant. At first, it wasn't so bad, most people just ignored me, as I waved like a moron at random strangers. None of the staff seemed to care either, the manager was mostly on his phone, and would randomly yell in a fit of anger. Raging, like a 12-year-old Twitch streamer. The real trouble came when it was midday, the sun at its highest peak, and the stuffy costume became unbearable. I was about to take off inside, when an arm grabbed mine. Despite how thick the costume was, the grip was iron strong, hurting through all the layers. It was a guy in nothing but a pair of scuffed jeans, topless, and muscled. Behind him was a crew of four other likewise dressed thugs, all holding weapons like bottles and machetes. A policeman walked by, took a glance and strolled away. We were in Kugman, one of the less fortunate areas in the city, and all around, nobody stepped in to help. Hey, have you seen this guy? The thug asked, brandishing in one hand, a picture of me at a casino. What time does he get off? I gulped. The debt was due. I quickly thought of something. He's inside. My voice was shaky, but luckily through the costume, I didn't think he noticed. He gets off at midnight. The guy took one look inside the busy restaurant and shook his head. Letting go, he signaled to his gang and took up a spot across the street in clear view of the restaurant. For the next few hours, I agonized under the suit praying they would leave. My actual end of shift came along at 4 p.m., yet I stayed. At 5, the manager came out and demanded to know what I was doing. I said I wanted to work some overtime, but he demanded I remove the costume and leave. The commotion attracted the interest of the gang, who watched warily. The manager waited for a response, staring. When I gave none, he spat on the floor, muttering words under his breath and returned to the restaurant. I followed, not soon after. In the changing room, I removed the suit, glad to be free of it. But I knew the only way out was through the front entrance. The back was always locked, only opened when it was time to close the restaurant. So I stayed, waiting and waiting. I didn't dare to check if the gang were still there. They surely were. It was eventually 11.30 PM, minutes away from closing time. Looking into the restaurant, most of the staff were gone, but the manager stayed, his back turned to me. Outside, it was pitch black. I caught a glance at just what the manager was doing on his phone. Gambling, the same addiction, the same vice, the same sin that had led me to this situation. Now I knew why he was so angry, he was losing outstanding amounts of money. I knew I couldn't stay forever, so I made my choice. Putting on the mascot uniform again, I left, the manager too engrossed in his phone to realize. Stepping outside, I began to pace faster and faster. I was so close to leaving, when? The same tight grip. Smiling gap-toothed, the thug raised a machete to my neck. It was over. He leaves at 12, right? What? I said stupidly. He leaves at 12, yes or no? Yes. I replied in terror. He let go, and with that, I frantically made my way home. The next day, the manager had been found dead, repeatedly stabbed. Naturally, the workplace was closed, so I stayed home, staring up at the ceiling, wondering just how close to death I was, myself. I realized that, if it weren't for the suit, that would have been me. But he was in debt too, it would have been his time eventually. I just took a gamble, and won, this time. But for how long, I was uncertain. I work at a Five Guys drive through restaurant. It's the first one in the UK, and staff were needed desperately. It's not terrible. I mostly work as a headset operator, taking orders and directing them to either the car park or the next window. It gets boring sometimes, but every now and then, there'd be a fun guy or gal, up for some light conversation, and even a how are you could make my day. Plus, 
you've got a camera, so you can see all sorts of people pulling up. Once, even a damn clown car came by, with some 20 people in it. But today, I met the sort of people that I didn't want to meet. Later on in the night, it wasn't that busy, so I slept for a good hour before I was rudely interrupted by the headset beeping off. Great, another customer. Hi, welcome to Five Guys. How can I help? No response. I check the camera. Instead, I see static. But I shrug it off. Maybe the cameras were broken. Hi there. Are you looking to order or- You have five minutes. The voice was crackly and distorted. Heavy breathing came through the other end. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Five minutes. That's all you got. Tell your friends. And with that, the screeching of car tires took off. I checked down my end, and the guys at the other window just looked at me, puzzled. I took it as some prank call, some edgy teenagers or something. I closed my eyes again. What awoke me this time wasn't my headsets beeping, rather the crash and banging from inside the store, screams and hasty yelling. Was it a rat? A pigeon? No, it was much worse. The moment I turned the corner, I watched in horror as a colleague of mine struggled in the grasp of a burly man wearing a trench coat and balaclava. He pressed his face down towards the fry station, bubbling at full heat. Around him, the rest of the staff cowed on their knees. He wasn't able to hold out for long, and just like that, his entire head plunged into the oil. Though his mouth was surely filled with scalding oil, his screaming was clear to hear. After a while, his legs stopped kicking and he went limp. The intruder then noticed me and began walking over. I scrambled to the office, tightly locking the door, and looked around for a weapon. Unsurprisingly, there was nothing. The door then shuddered once, and again. The man was trying to barge into the office. I pushed myself into the door hopelessly, and after the fifth push, I was knocked into the side cabinet, out cold. As I regained consciousness, there was a burning sensation on my back. It was warm at first, and then it got hotter, until I could barely withstand the pain. White stars filled my vision, and I could barely make out what it was causing me such pain. And then it clocked. I was laying flat on the grill, and the smell of my charred flesh filled my nose. I tried getting up, but two burly hands pushed me back down firmly. It was the same guy with the balaclava. He stared at me, unflinching. Underneath, the grill was becoming hotter and hotter. It felt like my skin was being burned to ashes. I flailed, but nothing would budge. I desperately grasped around the worktop beside me, when finally I picked up something familiar. Using a meat fork, I drove its prongs into the man's thighs. He released me, and I rolled onto the cold floor, sighing in his relief. But I didn't wait for long. Despite the pain, I hobbled into the fry station. I picked up a fry basket, and without a second thought, I hammered it across the man's face. In an instant, he plummeted to the floor, screaming in agony. But I didn't stop there. I continued smashing him with the same basket, relishing in the sinful act. I kept on hitting him until he was a bloody pulp, and with my stamina drained, I fell back. The floor was so cooling. I awoke in an ambulance, an IV drip attached to my arm the blinding light above me. I stood up shakily and overheard some officers outside. Yeah, he was the only survivor. You don't want to go inside their chief. Why is that? They've been cooked, all of them. Some of them eaten too, it seems. I stumbled back a little, and a mirror caught the corner of my eye. It was the cooked, seared meat that my back had turned into. As brown and moist as any burger we served, but nothing seemed more appetizing than what I saw in the reflection. Hey you guys, it's Rai Horror. It seems like many of you guys enjoy my animated stories, but only 27% of you are subscribed. If you want to see this channel hit 10k subs, then please like and subscribe. Now back to the show.
When the news arrived that we were going to receive more staff members, most of us were happy. It would make life easier at Jollibee. Personally, I was relieved, but to my surprise, there were also those who were afraid. When I asked them, they'd spin me tales of who these new arrivals were about cannibal practitioners and organ harvesters. It was true that most of these new staff were from a less reputable part of the city, Tonda. But their restaurant wasn't shut down because of voodoo or murder rituals, it was simply because of poor sales, the regional manager himself came down to say so. Even so, these new guys were certainly different from us. Skinny and pale, they looked ill and impoverished. The biggest among them looked more like a pencil than a person. But they were surprisingly polite and good at what they did. Quick hands and quick minds, they processed orders, cooked food, prepared drinks just as fast. If not, faster than us. We wondered why that was, if their sales were supposedly low. But in the busy workplace, such thoughts disappeared quickly as the next customer and the next and the next came flowing through. I had the opportunity to talk to one of the new staff. She was slim with shoulder length hair. She seemed so delicate, even a touch would shatter her. Under the tired eyes, though, she was unmistakably beautiful, which to my embarrassment was why I approached her in the first place. Hey, you look exhausted. In response, she gave me a glare, but it softened quickly. I am. She nodded in agreement. To tell you the truth, it was easier at our old place. Why was that? Well, for one thing, your meat isn't fresh. It's much easier to cook fresh meat than chilled. What do you mean? Don't worry, you wouldn't understand. And with that, she turned and left, leaving me bewildered. I made it my goal to get to know her and figure out just what she meant. Over the next month, my attempts were not in vain. The occasional chat between work, catching up at break, or workplace arrangements. Her name was Angelica, surprisingly a few years older than me and had worked at Jollibee's since leaving school. I would catch her looking at me from the corner of my eye whenever we were working and considered it a good sign. Another month, some of the new staff were promoted to managers, a gesture of goodwill I guess. Angelica was among them and she used her position from then on to tease me whenever she could. She had opened up a lot now, smiling and laughing freely. Whenever she did, her old colleagues would flash me death stares and I basked in their jealousy knowing I had accomplished what they could not. There were changes to the workplace as well. For one, customers seemed to be pouring in a lot quicker now and our usually slow meat fryers were chucking out patties and chicken at absurd rates. There was a room we never used that was now converted into a freezer and regularly staff would enter it and leave it with heaving sacks, though about 90% of the time this job was given to the Tonda staff, including Angelica who would regularly disappear to the back for long periods of time. One day, I was put out back to clean up the dumpsters and bins that were usually overflowing. The stench was absolutely unbearable. Scrubbing the grease from age-old containers and stashing bin bags away into a nearby crusher. Whilst carrying a bag, the bottom split and the trash sloshed out onto the floor. Sighing, I got down to cleaning it up when something sharp cut my hand. Inspecting the object, I frowned. It was a jagged tooth, not human. I assumed nothing of it, throwing it into the crusher as well and continuing with my work. The next day, I was put in the same place, to my disappointment. It meant I saw very little of Angelica. But it was alright, considering how bad I smelt. Regardless, I set to work straight away. There were no jagged teeth this time, but the work was hard nonetheless. The beeping of a lorry reversing indicated the day's stock coming in and I took a break to watch it. I was taken aback when I saw Angelica, hands on hips. She was berating the driver, but it was too far to hear. Something about lateness. He got round to unloading immediately cardboard boxes that were dripping. Angelica watching all the while. Suddenly, she whipped her head around and I ducked. She saw me though, I could tell. When I looked over again, she was nowhere to be seen. The driver was closing up the back, his delivery complete. I was put back into the kitchen the following day 
but Angelica was suddenly much colder. She put me to harder tasks, without the hint of a smile. When she went out to the back door as expected, I followed her. Unnoticed, I slipped behind one of the dumpsters. The lorry came in, right on schedule. This time, I could hear their conversation clearly. That's better, can't let the meat get spoiled. The truck driver grunted in response and got to work. I think someone saw us yesterday. You want me to take care of him? No, I've got it covered. And with that, she went back into the kitchen. I looked at the driver. His pants were soiled, dried blood encrusting his boots. His Jollibee's hat was patchy and unshaven, he looked disgusting. The moment he carried off his first load, I hurried over, probing the rest of the boxes. The smell was sweet, sickingly so. I punched open a random one and looked inside. Stuffed to the brim were various dead animals. Rabbits, rats, dogs, cats. Whatever, all mashed together, almost unrecognizable from one another. I opened another box, the same thing. Even a damn lizard thrown into the mix. Suddenly, I felt something press up against my back. A knife. Well, 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 look who it is. Don't they say that curiosity kills the cat? It was the truck driver. You guys are sick. Is this what we've been feeding people? Grabbing me roughly, he guided me back into the restaurant. A few staff members walked past and grinned. They were all the Tonda staff. I was led to the freezer room. Open it now. I did and did everything in my power not to hurl. A skin monkey looked back at me, dead and lifeless, swinging from a hook in the ceiling. More lined the walls, and I was stuck counting when a loud bang returned me to my senses. Angelica, in an apron, a cleaver in one hand, a chopping board in front of her, cutting apart a squirrel into chicken breast-like portions. Noticing my expression, she smiled an evil smile. Fresh meat. I told you it was better. I said nothing and she raised the cleaver towards me. Not a word, otherwise. You wouldn't dare. Her face seemed almost regretful. I never want to see you in this city again, unless you want to end up like the rest of our furry friends. But what if he tells? He won't. Now, get the hell out of here. And with that, I was spun around and thrown out of the freezer. When I returned to the kitchen, the same staff from earlier seemed surprised to see me, but said nothing. I noticed sullenly how none of my original colleagues were there. The place was filled with Tonda people. And I was alone. I've been working at Five Guys for a while now. I know all the staff, and for the most part, they're all fantastic people. Apart from one guy. His name's Chris, and I honestly don't know what his problem is. Whenever I ask him for help on a certain task, he just scoffs and walks away. And whenever he needs help himself, he'll order everyone around like he owns the place. I mean, he's not even a manager. It's not like he has any business telling us what to do. Just about everyone hates him. Nobody more than his own girlfriend, who also works here. She's Juliana, the complete opposite. She's sweet, funny, and likable. Every single shift I was in, you could hear Chris's annoying voice, even over the general ruckus of the restaurant screaming about dumb things like sending down the food late or leaving a door open. Where are the fries, man? Can you hurry up with the orders? Hey you, give me the chicken strips right now. Honestly, I don't know what Juliana saw in him. One night, it was especially bad. It was near closing time, when quite suddenly we could hear Chris and his girlfriend arguing in the back room, away from sight, but definitely within hearing. This time, it was about who was responsible for clearing out the trash, and to nobody's surprise, it was Chris's turn. Just when arguing turned to screaming, the loud crack of a door opening sounded. Our manager, this tall built dude called Dave, rushed in to check on the situation. Now don't get me wrong, Dave's a great guy, he's got that quiet but dependable nature about him. But get him angry, like a few unfortunate customers have in the past, and all hell breaks loose. Hey Chris, stop complaining and get the hell back to work. Dave's yelling easily overpowered Chris's and it was over in a few seconds, with Chris leaving in a huff, red-faced and fists clenched. 
Dave came out a few seconds later, and in a low tone, told us we could leave for the night, assuring us that he could run the store until closing time. A few of us stayed on regardless, impressed with his diligence and display of power. We watched as he took Juliana upstairs, her head facing down. That was the last time we saw her that night. She returned to work the following morning with Dave, a lot cheerier. Chris also came in, but Dave made sure to put him on bin duty, away from sight and far from Juliana. What he did next was surprising. As Chris turned his back, Dave gave her a quick peck on the cheek, which she didn't resist. Instead, she blushed. She then returned the favor. For two months, Dave would repeat this, coming to the store with Juliana, sending Chris to the bins, kissing his girlfriend, touching her shoulders and continuing with his work. We found it hilarious. Chris was an asshole, and if this didn't stomp out the flames of his ego, we didn't know what would. If only we knew just how much fury he held inside. One particular night, Dave, thinking the coast was clear, started to flirt with Juliana once again, touching her shoulders and whispering sweet nothings. However, after all this time, Chris finally came storming into the kitchen, completely dismissing his duties. And just like that, Juliana was caught cheating. I knew it! Dave, you son of a- Chris said as he tightly grabbed a hold of Dave's collar. Stay away from me, Juliana. I'm warning you. And for at least five minutes, Chris stood there talking crap, while Dave remained calm and stoic. Juliana, on the other hand, was horrified. Chris, please don't. There's been a misunderstanding. Listen, Chris, we can settle this the old-fashioned way. But if you don't want to lose your job, then you better get the back to bin duty. Chris was still seething with anger, but he restrained himself with every ounce of willpower. But just as he was turning back towards the exit, Dave made an audacious remark. Maybe she just wants a real man. He said it in a quiet undertone, yet Chris heard every word of it. What the f did you just say? And instead of backing down, Dave came forward and said it loud and clear. Maybe she wants a real man you know. Instead of a fat, ugly coward who cries about everything. Look guys, Chris is about to wet his pants. Why you little? And without warning, Chris threw a punch at Dave. But Dave, as calm as the sea, dodged the punch and gripped Chris's arm with ease. This was the act of aggression that he had been waiting for. A brawl ensued, one which saw the much larger Dave keep his opponent on the back foot. At that point, I don't think Dave cared about his job anymore. Instead of backing off on the defense, he started to attack Chris. The way he punched Chris again and again would make you cringe in pain. Every single employee just stood there watching, too shaken to move. The next moment happened in a flash, quite literally a flash of steel. From his pocket, Chris pulled out a knife, which he drilled into Dave's stomach. He cried in agony and collapsed to the floor. As he tried to cover up the deep wound, Chris's face was a bloody mess, bruised and battered, but the vengeance he had in his eyes pushed him to do the unthinkable. He pulled the knife out of Dave's stab wound and raised it over his head. Now you'll know my pain! Die! And just as Dave was about to meet his fate, Juliana's quick thinking saved his life. Taking a heavy fire extinguisher, she smashed it into the back of Chris's head just like that, he crumpled to the floor. She then proceeded to hit him three more times, just for good riddance, before she collapsed to the floor in tears. Dave somehow recovered, but he was in critical condition and had to spend the next two months in hospital. In some kind of miracle, him and Juliana won the court case, as he had only retaliated in self-defense. He also went on to make it official with Juliana, and soon they were off on their honeymoon. Chris also survived, but he was completely brain dead. So much so, that he could only ever mutter one word. I'd see him every now and then, taking a walk with an attendant outside the hospital. His head was mishappen, and all he barked out was, Die! 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 My name is Sam. 
I'm 23 and I go to the gym quite a lot. I guess you could say I'm a bit of a gym rat. Ever since I was a kid, I would get bullied for my size. Being a skinny 5 feet 4 dude made me an easy target for kids to pick on. So, one day in 10th grade, I decided that enough was enough. I definitely wasn't gonna grow taller. So, yeah, I had to get big. And ever since then, I've been going to the gym 6 days a week, every week. I'm no Mr. Olympia, but I've built myself a good physique for people to take me seriously. But yeah, anyways, it was one particular day, I was on the bench press, hitting a top set of 200 pounds. And just as I was struggling to finish the last rep, I felt someone push down the barbell towards me. Come on, bro. Is that all you got? Wait, wait, baby. This would be disappointed. I cried in agony as I could no longer lift the weight up. Dude, what the hell? Get it off me, please. I was about to be crushed by the weight, all because of some idiot. My arms started to burn as the weight got closer and closer to my face. And just like that, the weight was jammed to my throat now, my arms struggling to keep the weight from completely crushing me. However, on the brink of death, a huge guy intervened. He shoved off the idiot and pulled the weight off me, back onto the rack. I stood up anxiously, rubbing my throat. I thanked the huge guy. And he walked off, glaring at the idiot. I started to make my way as far away as possible. I was angry and surprised. I couldn't believe that I let some random dude nearly strangle me to death. And that's when the same idiot bolted towards me with startling speed. He was grinning at me madly while his eyes were wide and bloodshot, as if he was on some type of medication. I was becoming desperate now, I frantically ran towards the dumbbell rack and picked up a 50 pound dumbbell. I had no other choice. Don't come any closer or I'm gonna hit you. As he got within one meter of me, I swung the dumbbell at him with full power. He then fell face first onto the floor, unconscious. Not only had I swung at full power, he had also come at me with full speed. So, no wonder he was out cold. I stood there shaking with adrenaline as the entire gym went silent. I could feel all the eyes staring at me, judging me. For God's sake, I thought. Now I was in serious trouble. 30 minutes later, the police arrived. Luckily, the CCTV had captured all the scenes that had unfolded and I was cleared of all charges. The crazy idiot, on the other hand, had been charged with assault and was taken into custody. Also, he later went on to admit in a police interview that he had consumed a whole scoop of pre-workout mixed with an unknown substance. You can guess what the unknown substance was. He thought it would give him a sick pump and it would get him closer to looking like his idol, sis. So Jim Rats, what's the moral of the story? Take it easy on the pre-workout. And don't add anything to it, because it will not help you get a sick pump. I'm a 23-year-old guy, and I've been in a relationship with my 21-year-old girlfriend Lisa for a couple of years. Safe to say we both got pretty comfortable with each other, which meant we went out to eat a lot and skipped the gym within the past year. We didn't gain much weight, but we both lost a lot of muscle, and at the time of this incident, we both decided that we wanted to get back into the gym and have a healthier lifestyle. We figured that we could make it our New Year's resolution. I never really did resolutions in the New Year, but my girlfriend was adamant, and I'd do whatever to make her happy. She had started getting really serious about it, making meal plans and doing research for different workouts that we could do together, and I thought it was really great that we were actually going to do this. I was super optimistic about it, and the last thing I would have thought would happen to us, well, it happened. When January 1st rolled around, we spent the day researching different gyms near us and the classes they offered to try to narrow down which one we wanted to go to. It was a little difficult because we both wanted very specific classes and not all were offered at the same gym. But me, being the kind of man that will always try to make his girl happy, I just told her that we could go to the gym that offered what she wanted and I'd be willing to try something new. It was a gym actually just around the corner from our house. We lived here for a few years and within that time we'd had no issues and we actually liked it a lot. On January 2nd we went to the gym and signed up for their 3 month plan. 
We didn't want to risk signing up for a year if we didn't end up liking it. That day, we did a short workout together to kind of get us into the swing of things and get familiar with the equipment. It was great. The next few days we both did some classes and got to know the different instructors and even started making a few friends. It was turning out at the time to be exactly what we needed. Fast forward to a couple of weeks, we had gone to the gym like we always did, only this time we decided to go on a Friday which was unusual for us. Lisa usually worked Fridays and I didn't like to go without her so I stayed home, but this week she had Friday off so we decided to go. We didn't realize it at the time but Fridays were their weightlifting class days. When we walked in there, there were these huge bodybuilder type guys walking around the gym and Lisa and I both commented to each other that it made us a little uncomfortable. Nevertheless, we started our workout routine for the day and tried to ignore the huge roided out men around us. I'd say about 30 minutes into our workout, I started to notice one of the bigger guys staring at Lisa. I mean, just unashamedly staring right at her. He even looked at me, noticing staring and smirked like he knew I could see what he was doing, but he just didn't seem to care. And that's when he started walking up to us. He walked right past me and stood in front of Lisa and said, Hey honey, you want a real man to show you how to tighten up that little body of yours? Lisa looked at me and of course she was immediately uncomfortable by that comment. I was scared for both of us at that point, given he clearly didn't respect either of us or our personal space and he was huge. If he tried to fight me, I would easily be killed by this man, I thought to myself. Uh, dude, she's with me. Can you just leave us alone? I tried to talk as calmly as I could, but I knew I came off as more nervous than anything. Hey, hey, hey you let the lady speak? I think I know what she wants. He didn't even look at me when he said that. He just continued staring down at Lisa waiting for her reply. When I looked back towards her, she was now staring directly at me with water beginning to pool in her eyes. Lisa isn't one for confrontation. She really doesn't like attention at all. It was a miracle she gave me a chance given she couldn't even look me in the eyes the first few times we went out. I tried one more time to get this guy to leave us alone. I just grabbed Lisa by the arm and lifted her up off the yoga mat that she was sitting on. We took a few steps away from the man and in the most serious voice I could muster I said, "Hey." You leave us alone. She isn't interested and this is insanely rude and creepy. Just go back to discussing doping with your buddies. Clearly that's what you're really interested in. No, I will say that probably wasn't the smartest thing to say to a man clearly using steroids. I should have known making him angry would cause a problem. His testosterone levels must be through the roof for him to do what he did. He started walking away and I thought that was the end of it. I turned towards Lisa and told her that we should get going and we could come back another day. Only she didn't answer me. Her eyes went wide and she told me to look out. The next thing I knew a dumbbell came flying right next to my head and shattered the mirror in front of me. I turned around quickly and saw the same guy picking up another dumbbell, getting ready to throw it before his friends ended up grabbing him. Lisa and I quickly picked up our things and ran towards the office to tell the manager what had happened and have them phone the police. When the police got there, they did arrest the man who was subsequently banned from the gym. We did decide to press charges but were informed that we probably wouldn't hear anything about the case for a couple of weeks while it was being processed. And they were right. For the next couple of weeks we heard nothing about it. We did ask the police department to let us know if he was released. We really didn't think that he was going to do anything, but we still wanted to be as cautious as possible just in case. Now lo and behold, three weeks after the incident we got a call saying that he was out, and it freaked us out a little, but we figured that we probably wouldn't run into him. Where we live is a big city and we didn't go out much anyways. We continued going to the gym as usual and nothing like that happened again. We were beginning to feel comfortable again, or so I thought. A few days passed since the man had been let out and we had just gone to bed. We were meticulous about closing all our doors and windows and locking them for the night. We were actually both pretty paranoid about someone breaking in since our neighbors were robbed a few months back. At around 2am I was woken up by Lisa shaking me telling me that someone was in the house. There's not many things that can wake me up that fast, but that's definitely one of them. 
I pretty much jumped out of bed and grabbed the bat I keep under it. I walked toward the bedroom door and opened it just a crack to see out. Man, let me tell you, I was absolutely shocked to see, you guessed it, Royd Head standing right in my living room. I shut the door as fast as possible while making as little noise as I could and locked it. I whispered to Lisa to call the police and tell them that someone was in her home. She started freaking out and I had to try to keep her calm so he couldn't hear us. I opened the window that led from our bedroom into the side yard and instructed Lisa to climb out. After she did, I climbed out next and made sure to close the window behind us just in case he managed to get into the bedroom. I didn't want him to know where we went. Lisa called the police and told them what was going on, and they told us to get to a neighbor's house and wait for the officers to arrive. Just as we opened the side gate to exit the backyard, I heard a loud crash coming in from inside the house. When I looked back into the bedroom, the man had barreled his way through the door and into the room and started looking for us. Lisa and I rushed out of the yard and banged on our neighbor's door until they let us in. The police were there in 15 minutes, and we watched through our neighbor's window as they escorted the man out of her house in handcuffs. They ended up telling us that they found rope, duct tape, and zip ties in the back of his car along with a gun and a couple of knives. He eventually confessed that he found her names from us pressing charges against him since I guess that's public record or something. Knowing our names made it easy for him to find her address online. The police obviously had enough evidence on him to charge him with home invasion and attempted abduction. His bail was set high enough to where he couldn't afford it, which we appreciated. He got five years in prison, which to us seemed pretty fair. We moved out of that house and into a different one closer to Lisa's parents just to be sure that he wouldn't be able to find us whenever he did end up getting out of prison. He never said why he broke into our home or what he was going to do to us. But good God am I glad that we never had to find out.